Hi, I'm Dr. Rosemary Mazinet. I'm the Chief Science Officer for Columbia Care. Um, I'm a member of the Center for Medicinal Cannabis, and I'm here today with a podcast for the Cannabinoid Journal. Um, this is the fourth podcast that we've had. They've usually been hosted by Dr. Daniel Couch, but today this was going to be the inaugural all women cast for our podcast. So I'm delighted to have with me Dr. Nicole Stone, uh, Dr. Stone has just gotten her PhD at the University of Nottingham and has moved to the University of Sheffield. Uh, and Dr. Elizabeth Phillips, who's a well-known uh, clinical uh, neuropharmacologist and a leading expert in phytocannabinoids. And I'm, I'm very happy to have you here today. Perhaps um, Nicole and Elizabeth, you could just say something about how uh, you got into cannabis, why you're interested in it, why you've studied it for so long. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Shall I, shall I start and, and just do a brief introduction? It's great to be on the uh, Cannabinoid Journal podcast today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Elizabeth Phillips. As Rosemary said, I'm a clinical neuroscientist. So I have always had a fascination for drugs that really support brain function and brain health. And uh, really it's been a number of years that uh, I've been, well, 20 years in fact, since I've done my PhD in neurodegeneration. And it was really looking at the cannabinoids that support uh, the reduction of, of cell death, neuronal cell death, that, that first got me interested. Um, but now with the sort of real revelation over the years of the endocannabinoid system, um, I'm very keen as well to you know, provide translational research in how we should be supporting the endocannabinoid system within a clinical setting and, and understanding a little bit more around how these cannabinoids are working in the body. So that's my, my area and how I got interested in this, this particular area. <laughs> Um, thanks, Rosemary, for the introduction. Um, so my way into the cannabinoid field was a little bit um, <laughs> disjointed, to say the least. Um, I knew nothing about phytocannabinoids or the endocannabinoid system. Um, and I picked the PhD purely because it was to do with the blood-brain barrier, nothing to do with the compounds being <laughs> studied. Um, I accepted the PhD and under the supervision of Dr. Saoirse O'Sullivan, um, I became fascinated with um, cannabinoid pharmacology and um, the endocannabinoid system, particularly with astrocytes actually, and microglia and CB2 receptors um, and studying um, minor phytocannabinoids. So those aside from CBD and THC, as we all know, um, and their effects on um, astrocyte health and blood brain barrier permeability. Um, and from there, I just, you know, became engrossed with the field. And yeah, that's my background. So thank you very much for that. Um, as many of you know, I'm actually, um, I was a, clinic, a clinical oncologist, hematologist for a number of years. So I actually come to the space with an appreciation of how much patients can be helped clinically in the oncology space. Um, but I'm fascinated to learn more about the science because this is so very interesting. You know, when, when I started um, uh, practice, um, not long after I was a young oncologist, uh, Marinol, which is synthetic THC, was approved for use by the FDA and then globally really for, for chemotherapy patients who had nausea and vomiting. And it was never really, um, uh, a, a, a well-marketed drug or well-accepted drug. People didn't like the effect of the, the, the pure synthetic um, THC, the, the cannabis. So what we're gonna talk about today is really the entourage effect. And I, I thought maybe I would ask um, Nicole first to, to talk sort of as a follow-up to what she talked about in her article uh, on CBG and other minor cannabinoids and how important they are to help mitigate some of the, the, the um, effects that uh, uh, cannabinoids can have that are unpleasant and how it can accentuate things that are important and, and are very good uh, for, for the patient acceptance, for the patient experience, and for the field to understand a little bit more about why the entourage effect is important. Um, so, uh, from what we know about THC and CBD, um, CBD obviously mitigates some of the side effects of THC in patients, but actually the entourage effects of the minor phytocannabinoids aren't well known. So in conjunction with, you know, administration with CBD, with say CBG or CBDV, 
etc is not really fully understood and the entourage effects that I'm aware of um, haven't been clarified in publications a lot of it is speculative and not um, you know solid science and backed up with reproducible results so I think a lot more is needed to be done in future studies to elucidate this effect particularly you know do they mitigate THC's effects or do they um, enhance the effects of THC in some particular responses or, or the other phytocannabinoids. So to answer your question, we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> but just with regard to the minor cannabinoids and, and CBD, which they're often paired with, um, is, is there um, uh, something that we can understand about receptor binding? You know, to someone, even to me, I mean, all of the, the, the studies on receptor binding seem a little confusing, you know? There's agonism, which is binding. There's antagonism, partial agonism, partial antagonism. And what does that mean? What, what would you like to impart to our listeners so that they'll understand a little bit better how to interpret this, all of this data that, that they may read or see? Um, I think you're right. It is very confusing. It's almost like the more papers that are generated and the data at the end of it, it muddies the waters even further because you see, you know, different effects at different concentrations. Some compounds behave at agonists at low concentrations that then become antagonists at higher concentrations. Also, for the cannabinoid receptors, there's not um, a great library of antagonists to probe these mechanisms that are very selective. So this can hinder the, you know, the data being churned out by scientists because, you know, is that is that really true? Is it specific enough? Um, are the compounds, you know, being blocked by said antagonists, or you know, is it just not working specifically enough? So I think a lot more is needed to generate specific antagonists for the cannabinoid receptors, CB1, CB2, and any of the other targets, so 5-HT1A. Um, and then to test these compounds and unpick the data and thoroughly understand their mechanisms of action. Because at the end of the day, you get, say, one paper saying that one compound is an agonist, but then saying it's a partial agonist at this. And to be honest, when I was muddling through my PhD, I read a lot of papers and got highly confused by some of the data that was being put out by different groups. So I think we need more clarity on this and some more robust data. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure that Elizabeth has some comments on that as well. Um, you know, how should people who are seeing all of this information, because we are bombarded with information from, from not just researchers, but from companies who are telling us that, you know, their products are enriched for this minor cannabinoid or, or that minor cannabinoid. How, how, should we, how should we interpret that? Yeah, I mean, I think Nicole's made some really good points um, about the, the fact that certainly, you know, the cannabinoid research area is playing catch up with the medicines, and it's normally the other way around. I mean, certainly in my pharmaceutical experience and over the years, you know, normally we find that the system has been identified fully and then we're able to, you know, apply um, our sort of pharmacolo pharmacological knowledge um, to that. But it's kind of in the reverse with the endocannabinoid system. I think in terms of um, what we're also having to consider, uh, and, and I'm talking about researchers here before I come on to talking about, um, you know, sort of uh, users and, uh, and, you know, how patients can under best understand products. But also, of course, we're not just talking about cannabinoid receptors. You know, there's still so much research that needs to be done to look at how these you know, minor cannabinoids, you know, work at, you know, so-called orphan receptors or other receptors that in time are going to be, um, you know, sort of added into the endocannabinoid cannabinoid system database really because I know we're already on to a putative CB3 receptor you know having had CB1 and CB2 um, identified so again you know we're, we're not just looking at, uh, at one site you know one target within the body there's going to be multiple sort of therapeutic effects uh, and what combination that has you know within a especially you know within a full plant medication um, you know is going to, to take a little bit of teasing out. But in terms of what this practically means for consumers is, you know, I think it's it's best to, you know, go with, uh, you know, the, the groups that are, are producing the medications at the moment, certainly the ones that are enriched for the more minor cannabinoids. Uh, the recent article that I wrote in the Cannabinoid Journal was for CBN. And uh, there's, uh, you know, certainly some direct research looking at um, epidemiolosis uh, below, um, uh, 
the um mm -hmm. sorry the, the skin disorder thank you yeah um and glaucoma as well um so you know you, we're, we're getting quite specific with you know sort of different uh enriched formulations that can be used with with uh, with different um different conditions so you know it's really to you know what i would advise and do advise patients is is it's not getting too sort of het up in in the specifics but it's it's looking for quality products that know the levels of compounds and cannabinoids um that are within there of course it also you know as nicole was saying sort of you know muddies the water when we've got you know lots of different cannabinoids around and i work a lot in the professional sports field um and certainly you know it's only cbd that has been passed by the world anti-doping agency wada um so you know you're getting then you know sort of consumer-based products that athletes are taking that maybe contain other cannabinoids including the rarer ones that uh, we're discussing today that then you know, might have an impact you know within a drugs test or indeed any tested profession so i think you know it's about taking a product that you know is either understood by your physician by your doctor by your clinician um or, you know, sort of, uh, you know, looking at one that is going to, um, yeah, you know, support the, the needs uh, of, of what you're looking for. So um, I see that we've just added Dr. Tanya Bagger. Is that right? Yes. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. She's CEO and chairman of the International Institute for Cannabinoids. Um, welcome. Thank you very much. I had trouble joining, so for a half an hour I've been trying, but here I am. <laughs> so um, what we've been talking about a little bit and we'll, we'll, we'll throw you into this conversation is, is the, the, the minor cannabinoids and the entourage effect and how um, uh, really the research into how uh, cannabinoids can act individually and uh, in concert is not well described, right? So, you know, we're trying to tease some of that out. Um, I know that you have done a lot of work on THCV and we're gonna go there um, in a second, but I, I just wanted to ask Dr. Stone if she would follow up on some of the things that, that um, we had just talked about. You know, uh, there are all of these different um, cannabinoids that we've always known have been there. I mean, it's been known since the, you know, the early 2000s really that there were probably at least 90, right? Uh, cannabinoids in the plant. And now it's gone to 140. And I think in Israel they can test for more than 140, they now have the standards to be able to do that. But you know, what is what constitutes a, a therapeutic amount? You know, the endocannabinoid system makes law, makes products, but they're going to have a physiological, um, you know, effect. What we're trying to do is have a pharmacological effect, a medicinal effect. And you know, how much of these, how much of these do you need to see? You know, is is, is does two percent? Is that meaningful if you have two percent of CBG? Is 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 one percent of THCV enough, for example? You know what? What it, what's the right amount, or is it more is better? <laughs> I actually had a similar question from somebody else the other day, um, and I tried to explain it as a sliding scale. So, for something like say, I take CBD as an example. I know we're talking about the minor fat cannabinoids, but CBD is a very good example of this. If you were taking CBD for something like sleep or anxiety, you could tolerate a lower dose because it would be efficacious to produce the desired effect that you would want. But say if you were taking it for something like chronic pain, which was maybe in the middle of the in the middle of the scale, you would need to take a higher dose. And then for say epilepsy, which is you know right at the other side of the scale, you would need to take an even higher dose to see you know a positive um, effect. And we, in, in truth, we don't know about the minor phytocannabinoids. We don't know enough about them. Um, the studies that have been conducted in vitro and in vivo are still in the very early stages of being you know, teased out about what these cannabinoids do at what concentrations, at what dose. But I imagine that they probably will be similar to CBD in the sense that dose will determine like how how much of a compound will determine what for, what condition or what, you know, therapy. Um, and I think that's an important thing to get across to patients is the more uh, physicians we get educated surrounding cannabinoid pharmacology and the more data that scientists pull out from the preclinical side of things, we can collaborate together and decide what is best for the patient, for what condition, at what dose. 
And I think until that point, we can't really draw any solid conclusions until we've got the data at hand and the education for, you know, clinicians and experts. And that's my... So Tanya, I know that you have done uh, an excellent journal piece on THCV. I know that in the United States where uh, 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 medical cannabis is a, is a very different thing, um, you know, the products are not as regulated, they're state regulated, and um, they can in many states have increasing amounts of minor cannabinoids um, mm -hmm. listed. Um, you know, THCV is a very hot thing. You know, it's seen as um, uh, something that will help people uh, lose weight instead of have the munchies. Yeah, um, and and it, it's common in products in California and in Colorado because the high sun amount that they get at high altitudes there really makes plants that are very plentiful in THCV. So mm -hmm. it's very, very popular. And I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about um, your research on, on THCV. And again, how much do you need to have any pharmacological effect? Yeah, uh, so unfortunately, here in Slovenia, we haven't been able to do a lot of research and especially not clinical work concerning THCV, but I've tried to gather the data I have from other researchers from other clinics to see what exactly this THC is likely to do. Um, as you mentioned, um, it kind of has this reputation and as well a pharmacological side to it that indicates that it could be very helpful for many of the modern diseases we're uh, facing as a society, meaning obesity, meaning uh, uh, dysregulated blood sugar levels and etc. pre-diabetes, diabetes. And the reason is because um, it actually binds uh, with quite a good affinity to the CB1 receptor, but does not activate it, rather it uh, blocks this receptor. And um, this is the reason why we believe it does the opposite of munchies. It does um, take the level of the appetite down. And it has been shown in, especially in test animals, that it does reduce the uh, response of the uh, pancreas to the elevated sugar levels, meaning that we don't have such a strong response or we don't exhaust our pancreas as much even if we are not very cautious of what we are ingesting. Uh, and it seems that it does quite a good job at regulating how our body responds to these differences in the sugar level we have in our blood. Um, and this, I mean, it has also other potentials. For example, it has been very well shown that it has very good neuroprotective properties, which is a bit less known. Um, but maybe to return to the question of how much this is, um, as Nicole already said, this is a very difficult question. We have not actually been able to um, answer adequately this question regarding CBD. Uh, for example, maybe I can uh, illustrate, there was a study done with uh, epileptic children in Slovenia that have the same diagnosis for epilepsy. They were about very similar age range and also body weight. And some were epileptic free with 30 milligrams per day and some with 300 with this with very similar body weight with the same diagnosis so um, I don't think we will ever get to the point where we'll be able to say exactly the dose for every patient yeah uh, for neither cannabinoid probably because it depends on many many um many things that are going on in the body how many receptors are we expressing when and on which cells and what are the levels of our own endocannabinoids so here i don't think that we will have like an answer that will fit everybody right. uh, and especially for thcv um we are very far from guessing what the dose will be yeah. um, and that, that's exactly right. I, I think what's important um, also is that there is a ceiling therapeutic benefit to CBD, to cannabis-based medicines. So what's important for the patient is that, yes, it's getting the right dose for them, for their individual requirements, but that actually just continuing to take more and more and more is not, you know, going to be the best route forward. You know, that there will be a level, uh, you know, as, as uh, we, you know, we were saying, you know, whether that's 30 milligrams or 300 milligrams, yeah. whatever, cannabis 
cannabinoid we're measuring, um, there will be a, a ceiling therapeutic benefit. Yes, and for example, maybe maybe also this group with epilepsy illustrates this very well because you can really see uh, because uh, when they reached, for example, um, epileptic free states with these children and they elevated the dose of the cannabinoids, the epileptic seizures came back. Yes. So it's not that the higher is better. You really need to get the sweet spot. And unfortunately, just I think that still the best route to approach the dosing is just to start low and increase slowly. You know, this yeah. holy grail start low, go slow, and just observe what's happening. And then, yeah. Uh, for example, with THCV and with the uh, people that are um, wanting to use it to regulate blood sugar, this is fairly maybe easily <laughs> measurable because you can get these glucose meters um, freely available and you can just see where you're hitting that concentrations where you see that your sugar uh, glucose levels are better than if you wouldn't take anything. So. It's much easier to do the research if there's those solid markers. Exactly, <laughs> um, at the end. exactly. It's, it's the same with sleep. It's the same with inflammatory markers. And, you know, certainly in my clinical experience, you know, we, I see a wide range of dosing that doesn't necessarily correspond to, to body mass index. Or, mm. So it, it is absolutely about the patient individuality uh, and the right product. <laughs> yeah. so I, I want to go back to, to epilepsy for just a minute because... Um, you know, there had been a study conducted in Germany, I believe, a phase two study with CBDV as a single agent, right? Not CBD plus CBDV, but CBDV as a single agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it wasn't as successful um, in, in uh, uh, reducing seizures as CBDV had been. And I'm just wondering, you know, um, do you see a role for any of the, and they, they, again, this was an attempt to use CBDV as a monotherapy, uh -huh. not as part of an entourage, right? As, as a, so do you, do you see any role for trying to develop any of these individual cannabinoids um, as a single agent, as a monotherapy, or do you think that they're better served as part of a, a, a full spectrum product? I personally prefer a full, full spectrum product. Um, I think that, you know, nature produced the cannabis plants and, and that actually, you know, the, the more natural uh, a range of, uh, of cannabinoids that we can have, then we're going to you know, benefit more um, from that side. Um, I see the, you know, I wrote about the difficulties in the rarer cannabinoids in the production. Um, so CBN, for example, you know, such a small amount is produced naturally in plants through oxidation of THC that actually you know it's it's cheaper almost to, to isolate or, or to um to do a biosynthesis of it um but also you know when we start getting into biosynthesis you know we're, we're talking about nature identical mo molecules uh, but not you know the, the natural molecules themselves either so you know are there then changes you know at the receptor response are there changes to, to dose because it's more of a synthetic molecule than a than a, a natural naturally derived molecule so th there's all sorts of different you know sort of questions that that come up with that but full spectrum um if again you can take because you're not under a tested policy um, would always be my clinical preference. Nicole, did you have a comment? Um, so my focus was mainly, are you, are you specifically looking at the natural compounds that are produced in the plant, or could you kind of bring that into derivatives that groups are developing? So I know a number of studies and groups have shown that derivatives of CBG, so the VC dash 003 and you know the VC dash 003.2 um, they were actually more potent at uh, people gamma receptors and actually had greater anti-inflammatory effects and were tolerated better in rodent models so I'm curious to see if there are any derivatives of the other compounds that in the pipeline that could potentially be more therapeutically beneficial and offer greater um you know, targeted therapies for specific conditions. Um, and I think that's quite an important avenue to pursue. Could I add something? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so uh, for me, you know, as a researcher, for me, ideal case scenario would be that we would have all of them isolated for research purposes for specific things, but then to have a huge array of uh, 
chemo bars, meaning strains, where we would know exactly what the composition is. And then we could really choose. So, okay, for example, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the epilepsy because, for example, uh, there are some patients that are using multiple medications already, and there sometimes the isolated CBD was the best starting point because there was much too, there were too many interactions with coming with full spectrum, where they all got better effects also for anti-epileptic um, effects, even with the full spectrum, but maybe for the starting point, it was better to start with the isolated CBD. But for we, we know for the clinical practice that full spectrums are usually the things that we are looking for because they just, they just do the, the job of bringing this homeostasis much better than anything isolated or anything chemical. But you know, there are cases, and I, I think that it would be good to keep in mind that we don't have to talk about either either. So we can have all of it, you know, if we would be wise, I think we would have the whole spectrum of everything that we can have isolated to study some, some things, to have special clinical cases where these are needed, but then also to not forget that the plant in its natural wisdom sometimes does things best. Yeah. But we have to have an available spectrum of these um, plants with very well-known composition and then we can choose wisely but if we don't have that it's it's very hard to make a recommendation if we have a plant where we know two cannabinoids out of a thousand bioactive molecules right right and this and again my dream <laughs> and we don't have the same strains that we did now that they that they you know they've been adulterated so much that they did you say 3000 years ago when they actually were able <laughs> to grow different types, you know, a, a limited number of different types and they knew which worked best for pain, which worked best for seizures, which worked best for various conditions. It's very interesting. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask one other question of the group that um, I, I think might be confusing to some of the people who are, who are listening. And it has a little bit to do with, with CBN um, um, so, you know, I, um, I, I laugh when I think about CBN because, um, again, I um, went to college in the, in the 70s. So, um, you know, if I had any, um, and I'm not saying I did, but if I would have any cannabis to smoke, you know, it would put everybody, we would all get very mellow, go to sleep and, you know, get the munchies. I mean, that was, that was really what things were like okay, back in that period, because, you know, cannabis was stored in, in, in plastic bags, people kept it in their jeans pocket. Again, I know this only by, you know, uh, hearing this secondhand, but, you know, and so, so it was really the effect of CBN that we were probably having. It was a very mellow type of thing. And, um, you know, I, I, I let, we can talk about that a little bit because CBN is now becoming very popular, but it's also confusing to people because CBN is not in the T family, it's in the C family. So if we think about that is in a very simplistic way, you know, most of the things in the T family for THC, okay, have some um, uh, 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 psychoactive effect. And most things in the C family do not. Or again, that's been the classic wisdom. And I wanna make sure that everybody who sees this comes away with a better understanding of you know what what that means to be in the T family or the C family, why CBN is 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 a little bit different. It's more like THC. This is very confusing for regulators too when you think about you know the CBD level, the THC levels that are allowed in CBD because we have to add CBN into that. So it becomes very confusing. And I, I know that Nicole has a comment just she <laughs> about my use of the term psychoactive. Um, when I talk about THC that I think is important to set straight. So it wasn't even particularly your comment. It was something that was brought to my attention from a reviewer at a journal. Um, and they basically said that you're not really using psychoactive in the proper way. <laughs> I say proper way loosely, um, but meaning that CBD is psychoactive. It's an anti-anxiolytic. So it actually does have psychoactive effects. What you're saying is CBD is non-euphoric. It doesn't produce euphoria like THC. 
And I think that's an important thing to highlight is there's a little bit of, you know, misunderstanding maybe in the field, clinicians, you know, using these terms interchangeably and actually not highlighting that actually CBD is psychoactive. It's not, you know, a non-psychoactive compound. And I think that's really important to highlight. And in terms of terminology throughout the space, I think it needs to be clear for regulators, scientists and clinicians. So we all understand what points we're making and, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's a really important point that Nicole's made because, um, you know, certainly the psychoactive versus euphoric um, status. Um, I think what's interesting with CBN, though, is that it does have a mildly euphoric potential um, because essentially it's it's oxidized THC so you know my thought is you know has it been misnamed you, you know I mean these you know it's a very gray area when you look at structures you know do we put it as you say into the C family to the T family would that make it slightly easier and of course I mentioned in you know sort of professions that are drugs tested you know sports professional athletes then you know CBN is one of those cannabinoids that you know does have an impact um, on, a, on a drugs test would cause positive drugs Test. So, um, yes, we do need to be aware that there are certain cannabinoids which might have mildly euphoric um, properties. But also, I would, you know, sort of suggest that the strains uh, the, of, of street marijuana that were around a number of years ago, um, you know, had much lower levels of THC um, as well. So, you know, again, that's going to affect, you know, what, you know how much of the CBN, you know, was, was causing that, you know, we, we, we just, you know, we, we don't know that, you know, what, what those mildly euphoric um, sort of symptoms were, were fully accountable for. So, you know, I think with CBN, um, yes, you know, that it has the potential because of the, the similarities to, to THC, um, but equally that can provide, you know, part of the, um, you know, sort of uh, anti, um, uh, you know, sort of anti-inflammatory, the, the, the pain management um, aspect, um, of these you know particular minor cannabinoids so um so, so yeah it's it's a something we need to distinguish between but cbn in this case can indeed be confusing <laughs> well I, I i know that um for uh, uh people who are cbd users it's particularly because they think you know cbg is fine you know um other c's are fine so you know i think that that's that's been something that we need to we need to make sure that people understand because I do think that CBN will become more um, popular as as and more highlighted as an you know being in a product because it does have these uh, preferential uh, uh, features that are very attractive you know mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's more selective for CB2 um, receptors as well. So, you know, there's a, a really good indication for the sort of immune system um, status, you know, homeostasis and, and, and inflammation as well. So it's certainly one of the, well, very interesting minor cannabinoids, I would say that, but yeah, <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Right. So Tanya, you had joined us a little bit later. Um, the rest of us had all talked about, you know, how we, um, came to 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 um, have uh, I guess a passion for some type of cannabis study, whether it's clinical in my case or whether it's scientific in other people's cases. I'm just wondering if you can tell us how you came to this um, and and you know how you see things evolving over time for how you see the science evolving and the ability to translate that to patients as well. So I studied uh, microbiology and later I did my PhD from cellular signaling, and uh, we studied a lot of signaling molecules, and uh, I particularly focused on the calcium as a signaling molecule in my PhD, but uh, I was never taught about cannabinoids as signaling molecules. So then, uh, was it maybe 10 years after my PhD, I had a really boring job where I had a lot of time to study a lot of papers, which I always did about cellular signaling, my, my uh, understanding how cells in a body communicate is one of my great passions. And then one day I came across a paper saying, oh, so we have this endocannabinoid system. We have these cannabinoids that do exactly this crosstalk between cells. And I'm like, that can't be. If, if, I mean, if that was true, I dedicated God knows how many years of my studies to this. I would know. And I'm like, okay. And then I read more and more and more. And I was like, oh my God, this is really true. <laughs> so I, um, 
then went to uh, the first few conferences that discussed these topics and was hugely fascinated by what exactly these molecules do in our bodies. And then the um, pivotal moment for me was when I met a group of um, parents with epileptic children that were resistant to treatment. And at that point in Slovenia, there was no available cannabinoid products that was not, there was not a single doctor that these parents could consult. And then together we went to a few foreign doctors looking for solutions. And when I first saw these effects that the children had when started using CBD for their uh, epilepsy, I thought this, this, is, this is tremendous. I mean, if there's one or a few kids you can do this for or help that, they, that their health improves in such a way, this is totally worth my energy, time, everything. So uh, then um, a few of us uh, uh, started this institute, ICANA, that we have in Slovenia. And I did three other jobs so that I could support uh, the work that ICANA was doing. And this is how we started and have grown since um, as a, yeah. Well, as I, a field you know, also. I think, I think that, that, you know, you, you leave us with a very positive impression that we all share, which is that, you know, for, for those in, in regulatory um, uh, uh, positions, uh, or whatever, um, it, you know, in, in medicine and health, you know, no one can deny that cannabinoids work. I think that, you know, the Epidiolex experience and the, the great benefit it's brought to those children and their families, no one can deny that. So that's the thing I love to say to people when they say, oh, can't people just want to get high? Cannabis isn't doing anything. It's like, no, <laughs> you can't say that. That's not accurate. So, you know, we, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to be able to, to push the naysayers away, I think. You know, we're, we're having uh, 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 an increasing amount of uh, scientific research that backs up what we're saying. You know, this isn't just soft science anymore. Yeah. This isn't just, you know, um, again, a bunch of people who are looking to, to validate why they're taking this because they want to be high. That's not what we're doing at all. And I think that, that you know, the group today has really um, uh, brought that to the forefront. You know, this is, these are real products. These are real compounds. We're we, we don't know the depth to which, you know, they bind to other types of receptors. The endocannabinoid system is still being defined and expanded. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a very worthwhile effort of, of research and also, um, you know, that, that includes clinical research. You know, whether it's a registry, I think we should be tracking what patients take and respond to based on what the cannabinoid profile is of that. We've been trying to do that in the United States on the Columbia Care side, but, you know, it takes a, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of patience to be able to come up with that type of, of longitudinal data on people. But I was just wondering if, if, if you could all make a few concluding um, comments that that would be, that would be great. Um, Nicole, you want to you lead us off? Um, yeah, uh, so after my PhD, I have to say one thing that kind of struck me is the lack, <laughs> the, the breadth of what we don't know. And I think you highlighted that very well, is there's so much we don't know about these compounds. There's, there's a significant delay particularly because of the bans in you know, the 60s and 70s and the restrictions that was on cannabis research. We're so behind in terms of uncovering you know, the full profiles of these compounds and there's still a lot more work to be done. But on the flip side, that makes it such an exciting place to be as a researcher and as a clinician as well, is you just don't know what's gonna come out you know, in the next week, month or year in terms of cannabinoid research. There's still so much we need to uncover. Tanya, would you like to give us a concluding remark? Yeah, maybe I can just continue with uh, Nicole's part. So yeah, I agree. This is for me as a scientist, this is one of the most exciting fields uh, because there's just such a complexity in our endocannabinoid system. And there's so many, yes, angles and the effects of this system that we need to uncover. And especially if we look at the plant that has a thousand compounds that all kind of, yeah, have a point and a meaning of where they are and how much and in which ratios. But on the other side, I think that 
with what we already know, which is not little, we can do a lot. Yeah. You know, if we took the data that we do have and with the awareness that we're talking about very safe substances, we could do immense work already now. So in spite of the, a lot of work that we still have to do and a lot of playground to uncover, I think with where we are, we can do tremendous benefits for patients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd like to obviously, you know, second what Nicole and, and Tanya have said, and uh, I'm going to add a little bit further into the clinician side as well. Um, yes, the scientist in me is hugely excited for what we're uncovering and have done in the last few years around uh, cannabis based medicines and, and the endocannabinoid system. But I think as an integrative medicine practitioner, um, which is how I, uh, you know, sort of uh, approach my work, what's really exciting is the fact that, you know, for, for many years, all of my clinical practice and, and you know, way before that, um, you know, integrative practitioners have been looking, you know, for an in into helping people improve their health. And that might be the gut, which is one of the main ones. It might be the immune system. Um, you know, it might be the central nervous system. And, you know, it depends sort of, you know, at what point in the circle you want to sort of start addressing someone's health but what I found the most exciting is over the last three to four years when I've really been using um, cannabis-based products and uh, and uh, and the um, you know sort of C class of compounds that we've been talking about is realizing that the endocannabinoid system just has fingers in all of those areas you know it, it's it's about homeostasis across the whole body so actually as an integrative medicine practitioner now to have a system that we understand so much more that we have specific compounds uh, and you know specific supplements, specific medicines that we can use that are becoming more prolific and better quality and we better understand it, you know, actually we're opening up a whole new level of integrative medicine. Uh, and, you know, I'm seeing the benefits firsthand within my clinic and I'm very excited to continue the, what I call the translational research, drawing in what I read and applying it into to my patients. And it's just a, a hugely exciting area and, uh, and one that I'm really enjoying you know, educating practitioners more on and clinicians on um, about the wonders of the endocannabinoid system. So I think we're in a very exciting area, aren't we? <laughs> well, I, I have to say that, you know, um, if this is a group of women scientists and, and, and clinicians who, um, you know, are really so upbeat about this, you know, because of the, the promise in the field. So, you know, I, 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 I'm very um, happy that we see a bright future that instead of getting bogged down into the issues today, that we realize that you know it's it's the job of all of us to create data to convince regulators why this is good for patients and why these areas should be funded. And you know, it, I, I, I'm very proud that we're very upbeat about this and looking to the future. So um, I want to thank you very much for all um, uh, contributing today. I think we're at the we're past the 45 minute uh, mark. Um, so um, thank you very much. Signing off. Thank, thank you. you very much for having me. Episode five complete. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.